What's that saying mean? Make an ass out of you and me. Assume. Yeah, so what assumptions are you making when you, when you for the different types of analysis? So for parametric analysis, you're assuming Gaussian distribution. <laughs> so non-parametric analysis, you don't assume Gaussian distribution. So it's, these, these tests are good for non parametric distributions and that oh, where what am I doing it just disappeared it's not affecting me here so this when you have distributions of, of you know data like this is or your population distribution looks like this that you can do parametric analysis non parametric analysis means you have non Gaussian distribution of your data okay so the first te test they talk about in your book is the sign test. Has anybody ever heard of the sign test? No. Isn't it Yeah, it's it's a weird test. I've never done it or heard about it until I, I taught this class. So, <laughs> so it's one of the simplest non-parametric tests for comparison of two non-Gaussian populations. It corresponds basically to the t-test, but it's like for non-Gaussian. And it uses the median rather than the mean, right? Does that make sense? A lot of the non-parametric tests are going to look at medians rather than means. Because why is that? If, if you have a non-Gaussian distribution, you're going to have extreme values that, that are going to do what to the mean? Yeah, they skew that mean, but the median gives you an idea of what the middle is for non-Gaussian distribution because it's the middle value. So, so, <clears throat> so data in a single set can be compared with some stated cur or critical value. So that's the thing with this test: you have a single set of data, and then you want to compare it to some some value. Data points higher than the stated value are assigned a plus, while the values below the value are assigned a minus, and zeros are assigned values equal to the critical value. And the results can be used to compare the results of two methods using a paired sample, A with B. If B values are higher than A, then A plus is assigned. <laughs> if B values are lower than A, then a minus is assigned. And whether B equals A, a zero is the sign. So <clears throat> then you want to make a null hypothesis. What, so what, what, what are your, normally your null hypothesis? What's a null hypothesis? Remember last time your null hypothesis is that the means are the same. The one mean is equal to the, the other. And this, your median is going to be equal to the either the value you're testing against or the, the other median so and then s equals the number of values greater than the median each sample item is independent if the null hypothesis is true s should have a binomial distribution with a su success probability of 0.5 you, you guys remember binomial probabilities what are those like flipping a coin should give you a binomial distribution because it's either going to be positive you know heads or tails just like with this it's positive or negative right does that make sense so, so this is an example say you're an analyst for chef boy rd you've asked seven people to rate your ravioli on a five point scale one is terrible five is excellent what do you guys think of chef boy rd raviolis Huh? So you can give them ones or twos? Yeah, I, I would too. You never tried them? Good for you. Back when I was in maybe the fifth grade, I probably would have given it a five, but <laughs> but no longer. So at the point oh five level, is there evidence that the median rating is at least three? So. The null hypothesis is that n equals 3, because that's what we want to see if the median rating is going to be at least a 3. The, the alternative hypothesis is that the median is less than 3. The alpha is going to be equal to 0.05. So s equals 2 
below a 3, right? Is that right? So we have 1 and 2. These are the, the results we got from the 7. 2, 5, 3, 4, 1, 4, and 5. So is the observing 2 or more, observing a 2 or more, a small probability event? So then we have to look up in a binomial table. And they, I don't know, have you guys seen one of those? I could pull one up, maybe. <coughs> uh, probably should have just put one in the lecture, huh? <laughs> you didn't want to say anything? Uh, I mean, we can't pull up Acrobat here. Oh. So this is like your binomial table. Oh, where did it go? <laughs> oh, that's what happens when you don't clone them. <laughs> yes, it is, but I, I prefer not cloning them. So you see, as you can see, you can see your p-values, you have your n's, and then the different levels, right? So. So then you just look that up on the binomial table. Okay. And for this, we're going to not reject the, 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 you know, at point 0.05. And the conclusion is there is no evidence for a median being less than three with that data set. Okay. So this test I have done, have you guys heard of the man Whitney rank sum test? So this is another work test where you test two independent populations, kind of like a t-test. But again, instead of using, well, well, I'll just get through it. it corresponds to a t-test for two independent means. The assumptions are that they're independent random samples. Populations are continuous. This is a much easier test to do. <clears throat> Basically, what you do is you take your data and your two groups, you have them separated by groups and you're going to assign ranks. You, you like number them from the smallest to the largest and you rank them based on their numbers. And then you sum the ranks for each of the groups. And then you'll look that up in the table, the range you have for the different groups. Look it up in the table. And if it's out, based on your p-value again, your critical p-value, if it's outside the range, then it's significant. If it's not, and I got another example. So basically, sum the ranks for each sample. The test statistic is the smallest sample. The null hypothesis is both samples come from the same underlying distribution, right? Distribution of T is not quite as simple as binomial, but it can be completed. And this is our example. We want to determine if there's any sex differences in fasting blood glucose levels at your hospital. For males, glucose levels are 71, 82, 77, 92, 88. For females, 85, 82, 94, 97. It looks like it might be different, right? Yeah. But it might not be. We could do a t-test to see if it's different with the t-test, too, afterwards. So. But we'll do this first. So glucose levels have the same probability distribution at a 0 0.10 level is the what we're testing so the null hypothesis is that is that you know we're, we're the hypothesis is that they're identically distributed the alternative hypothesis is shifted left to right we, we don't care which alpha is going to be 0 0.0 0 0.10 in one the one group has four the other group has two so we have to have the the, the know the ends because we'll look that up on the table that has them distributed based on the numbers of ends. And this is what it looks like with an alpha 0.05 on a two-tailed. So do you understand that alpha 0.05 for a two-tailed test? It really is. So you have a two-tailed. Do you guys understand the difference between two-tailed and single-tailed test? No? <laughs> so you got your population distribution like this. So one-tailed test is where you select the, you know, you're looking to see if your values are going to be over here. If this is, this will be, let's say we're doing a 0.05 or 
Let's do 0.10 because that's what we're doing here. So then this data would be 10% of the data falls out here. So there's a 10% probability that your, your data would be over here. And that would be with a one, one tailed test. If it's a two tailed test, you don't select either side. You're just saying it's going to be different. You, you, you got to have specific reasoning why you're going to do a one tailed test. Does that make sense? You got to have a, a really good reason for why you selected a one-tailed te test and what direction it is. But So typically you're doing two-tailed tests. So for a 0.10, you're going to have 5% of the data here and the other 5% here. So it's 0.05 on either side. Okay, does that make sense? So it kind of divides up the probability. You're not making a hypothesis whether it's larger or smaller, even though you may want to. You just have to say you're using the two-tailed test. And it, they're typically harder to get your significance with the two-tailed test. But anyways, this is what the table looks like. So we have upper limits and lower limits. What were our ends? Do you guys remember? N1 was... Four and N2 is five, so with N1 being four and N2 being five, the range we're looking for is between 11 and 29, right? So, <clears throat> we scroll down. So, if we have anything that's between 12 and 28, if the range falls in between there, we don't reject. But if it's 11 and 29, anything Outside of that range, we're going to reject that null hypothesis. If the range is here, we don't reject. <clears throat> so now we got to sum the ranks. So we have all the data here, divided up by females and males. What we do is rank them. So the first one, lowest value is 71, it's in the males. 77 is in the males. 82 would be next. Oh, wait, there's two 82, so what do we do there? Right. Oh, how do you, you got the, 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 the thing, don't you? <laughs> so for those, we make them both three and a half, you know, so you kind of split up that rank amongst all the other ranks that are the same. And when you have the same values, you're going to split those ranks up. Then five. Six for 88, seven, eight, and nine. And then we just sum, sum these values and we get the rank sum for both the groups. And we get 19 and a half and 25 and a half. So where does that fall in this rejection area? It's good though, right? We're in the do not reject. So we don't reject at that level of significance. And the conclusion is there's no evidence that there's unequal distribution between those T statistics. Does that make sense? So it's simple. I like the man Whitney rank distribution. Let's look at that data with Excel, because you guys don't know how to do a t-test in Excel, right? So this is the data, I'll keep it up here. And I'll show you how to do this real quick in Excel. If I can find Excel, where is it? What does that say? How do I get a spreadsheet? Oh, where did that come from? Oh, no, okay, that, that, that's the PowerPoint behind the... <laughs> so here, we'll do a new sheet. Basically, you want to put your data in there. So we have males here. 
and then females here. Okay, and then we're gonna add the data, 71. Can somebody yell it out to me? Eighty-eight. Okay. Oh. So seventy-one and eighty-two. Eighty-five. Right here. Yeah. Not, not eight hundred and eighty-five, right? Okay. So to do normal statistics on this with Excel, you're going to hit equal. You're going to come up here. Yeah, and remember, we want to do an F test before we do a T test, right? Why is that? What does an F test tell us? Anybody? Anybody? Huh? It's variance. So, so you want to test that. Do, before you do a T test, you test with an F test to make sure your variances are equal. Otherwise, you're supposed to do a different type of T test. So, anyways, before we do that, I'll show you. You go here, function, and then we want to hit statistics in this little one. Statistical, we could look at the average. And then has this, so we just, we're just going to highlight these and then hit enter, and that's the average. And to get the average of this, all you have to do is get this little cross down in the corner and drag it over. And so that's the other average. So for the test, really for the, test the exam itself, no. But for your lab write-ups, it might be easier. But for the exam, I'll give you a table. So. You don't know how to use? Huh? You don't know how to use the table? In the book, it's you know, like that. Table, T table, F table. I guess you could use your calculator if you're good at that calculator. That, that calculator just does it all for you, though, doesn't it? You just put in the lists and then you say. And then you say, I would like a T test, or I would like a two variable T test. We shouldn't even test that. That's I, that's what I'm infer, That's what I'm trying to infer. Usually, what? So we should. No, we should. The calculator should do the test. That's yeah. You know, we're keeping up with digital technology. So. Well, what happens when you guys get your clinical lab jobs and these, like, in the middle, some, like, didn't you make a, a hand washing kit for South Sudan? Yeah, but we're not in the South Sudan. But you may end up there. You might need to do a T test. Yeah. Well, you need to the back, the backup generator. You know, it's like, you know, because the calculators are battery operated. <laughs> I guess it's a solar flare. You know. And we'll see, you know, it hits the earth and knocks out everything. Uh huh? Yeah. <laughs> we'll always need to go to work. That's no excuse, solar flare. The collapse of society is not a. Is a That's just an excuse to work harder. <laughs> You, you know, I am going to try to do the test online, so maybe you could use Excel for, for this. But then it's so easy to do it by Excel. When I took stats, they made us use tables. They, they make us use, here they make you use the calculator with all the little. Oh, we're doing the test online? Well, yeah, because uh, I think Eileen wants to get all the test questions in, in Canvas, yeah, in a bank, and then we're going to assign them. Specific course objectives and things like that. So, wait, so are there tests on paper or on a computer? They're going to be on a computer this year. For all of our And Dr. Smith, I don't know. He likes the scan. He'll be the last one to ever Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, I showed you how to do a mean. How do you think you do the standard deviation? Equals. So do equals. Hit on the, hit the F. F. Statistics. Statistics and scroll down. 
standard DVP. Oh, well, there's a couple standard deviations. Huh? Yes. Why yes? Because we're not doing the population, we're doing the sample. Very good. And what's the difference between a sample and a population? The population is everybody. Yes. The sample is only somebody. Do you know the difference in the formula between standard deviation and sample? One of them uses n and one of them uses n minus 1. Which one uses which? And minus one is the sample. Yes, yes. Very good. Look at you. <laughs> so there's our standard deviations. What do you think the variances are going to be? Uh, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm not saying for the calculation. You could just tell me. How, how, how do you calculate the variance from these standard deviations? What? I can't hear you. I can't speak. I heard somebody speak. You said a word? Or you mouthed some words. The variance is just the square of the standard deviation. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I knew that. Okay, now we'll do the F test, right? We want to do an F test. So again, equals, then the little function. Where are we? There we go. F test. And we'll hit OK. This is array one. And then we got to click here for array two and highlight the females. And hit OK. We'll see what happens. So it gives us a p value. It doesn't, it doesn't give us anything but this number, but this number represents a p value. And that p value is 0.82. So if we were using significance level 0.05, would that, are these variances different or are they the same? Do you guys under no they're the same. Do you not, do you know what the point eight two stands for? What what that is? P value of that F test means? This is the probability that these two well, they're not variances there, but the, the variances from these two samples are are equal. It's an eighty two percent probability that they're equal. So when we pick a critical p value, we're, we're picking 0.05 a lot of the time, and that, that would be, we're going to say the two are different if the p value, if there's a 5% chance that they're the same or less. Okay? So if this was like a 0.02, we would say the variances are not equal, and then we'd have to do a different test, like the man Whitney ranks some test. But we can, we can do a t-test with these. So then we'll do the t-test here. And again, it's just the same way. T-test. Array 1, we'll highlight here. Array 2, we'll highlight here. And then it asks for the tails. And we've got no reason to do a one-tailed distribution. So we are going to do a two-tailed. So you type a 2 there. And then the type. So we could do a two-sampled equal variance. We have an equal variance and we got two samples. Two sample unequal variance is three. Are we missing something there? What's two? Oh, oh. Paired two paired is one. Are we paired? No, we're not paired because we weren't males first and then became females and got the I mean that might I mean it's possible. <laughs> You're right. But that, that's not what this test is. These are independent people. One's a male and then the others are females. Now we could do blood glucose close before a sex change operation and this was before and then after. That would be a, a paired sample but we're not paired so we want to select two there also. And then you hit OK. And it's going to come back with another p-value, 
So what does that tell us? So a 19% probability that these two came from the same population distribution. So the means are the same, really. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So that's how you do t-test on Excel. And it came to the same conclusion as this man Whitney rank, rank sum test. In fact, I think you can even do a man Whitney rank sum in this. I've never tried it, but let's see if it's there. Nothing here for M's, but I think rank sum maybe. I don't see it. <laughs> okay, so that's how you do the tests in Excel. Yeah. And I guess you could use Excel on the exam since we'll be on the computers anyways. Okay? Huh? So linear regression and correlation, what do we use these for? The relationship. Yeah, exactly. So you guys have done it in the lab before. Protein assays, you're describing. What, what relationship are you describing when you do a protein assay? I don't know if all of you have done it. Who's done a protein assay? Raise your hand. I think so. You think so? From, from our proteins class? Yes. Okay. You've done it then, right? Even in intro, I think you do a protein assay. <laughs> No, it's not the SDS thing. It's that thing on the plate reader. Remember, you, you guys weighed out a certain amount of albumin, and that's your protein standard. The amount of color that protein standard makes is related. Huh? You do that for a final The enzyme was messed up, so I kept messing up all my final. Enzyme? There's no enzyme in that. Whatever our final was, there was one of the reagents was like bad, and it made my numbers really skewed. And Allie kept telling me to redo it, and then it told me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Cause there, there is no enzyme for that assay. There's a color reagent, and then a lot of times what skews data is poor standards because you got to weigh the standard you're weighing a tiny amount and you got to do the dilutions properly also so that can skew your data one way or the other and then for that final we get the the the, the unknown protein directly from a vendor that tells us the concentration and it's pretty stabilized because it's been acetylated too so but i guess that acetylation might have an effect on binding to the dye no <laughs> wow, you said you got your proteins lab book. I'm using it for not the lab. Oh. <laughs> it was crude protein, and it was not my standard because my RT value is 0.98. No, 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 no. It could still be your standards. The R value just tells you how linear your standards were. If all your standards were linear, but you know, this goes into what we're going to be talking about next time. Wrong also. So, so it's a shift yeah. in, in away from the true mean. So you won't be able to tell what the true mean. So that means that your assay would have been biased one way or the other. And I think yours was biased up. You kept getting 15. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so that's. You know, since I talked to him before, I talked to Allie. Allie told me to stop. So, but anyways, that's what this is what we're doing with those protein standards. We come up with a relationship between two variables. One is going to be the concentration of protein in those standards, and what's the other variable? 
we got a whole chapter dedicated to it here in the future in this class. The absorbance of light through that sample. Okay. So those two things are related, and we have all the known standards, so we come up with a linear graph. relating the two and then with the unknown state we know we, we, we don't know the concentration of protein in the unknown standard right but we, we, we plot the absorbance of that unknown on the line and it tells us our our estimated concentration based on our standards so if our standards are off that estimation is going to be biased one way or the other what what kind of error is bias or what, what, what's that <coughs> Remember we talked about, what was it last time, precision versus accuracy? If, 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 uh, if something's biased, is that precision error or an accuracy error? Accuracy. Yeah, so that's following accuracy instead of precision. What's precision? Yeah, which is represented by what? As far as statistical measurements go. You know, anybody? I keep wanting to say that guy's name, but I can't remember the name of the movie now. So I got that, that one shot in the movie stuck in my head when I'm going, anybody, anybody? But it's, uh, Bueller. yeah, Bueller. You, you read my mind. <coughs> Bueller? <laughs> so, so which statistical thing that we calculate represents precision? I know you know it. Is it the, the mean? Median? Mode? <laughs> what, 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 so precision is your, your measure of scatter, right? How, how, how much the scatter is around the true point or you know the scatter it doesn't necessarily mean around the true point but around the average point of all your data huh no. what measures no. scatter no, no I, I didn't I, I didn't say which one it was because it's none of the ones I mentioned oh. just a minute ago <laughs> all of those are measures the middle of your data right so what which which one isn't a measure of the middle yeah, standard deviation or percent CV, those are all measures of variation, which are all measures of your precision. So, okay. So the difference between your mode, median, or mean, and the true mean value is going to be your accuracy. So, anyways, what, what was I doing? X is considered to be a fixed or independent value. Value. Y is considered to be, be not fixed or a dependent value. So it is valid then to describe Y as a function of X. So you guys have heard this lecture before, I'm sure. And <clears throat> regression analysis can be used to describe this relationship. And that's what we do with the protein assay. That computer does it for us. I've never calculated regression by hand. Is anybody here? It's supposed to be, huh? Yeah, exactly. Calculator does that, or Excel will do that, and there's tons of statistical software that does that too. So <clears throat> I'm not going to make you do that. But you guys remember the linear equation y equals mx plus b. So m is what? Slope. Yeah. So that describes the relationship basically between y and x, the change relationship, and then b is just the the y-intercept yeah <clears throat> so this is all very basic stuff we don't we don't need to talk about I'm supposing right but if you do the need to remember you know basic line and graph it's in that math book too in the earlier chapters that I skipped over so a slope of 2 means that for every one unit of change in X yields a two unit change in Y so, but that's what, what, why we do a, a regression because it allows us to predict, right? If we, if we can predict, if we know something about X, then we can 
predict something about y. And those are conditional probabilities. Regression equation is like this. So the expected value of y for a given level of x is going to be equal to a plus b x i. And I don't know why they changed that whole equation of a line, but they do. Again, so alpha, I think, is your y-intercept again. And b x i. B is the slope or beta, right? So. <clears throat> and then you also have this other term in here. So that's going to be your random error. So that's basically the precision of the data you collected. So you're going to have that random error in there. This is going to be fixed exactly on the line because it looks like a, an equation for a line, right? And then the random error typically should follow a normal distribution. So in practice, alpha and beta are known and must be estimated as A and B. Epsilon describes the distance between any observed value of Y and the corresponding predicted value for Y. And that's known as the residual, right? Have you guys heard of that, the residual? Residual error. Linear regression assumes that the relationship between X and Y is linear. There's some, we, we could do nonlinear regression, but we're not going to do that in this class. I think it might be in that math book, though, isn't it? Did you look? There's nonlinear regression in there. So the degree I got, we did nothing, or, or like for half of the people in my program did nothing but nonlinear modeling with like what last transforms, they come up with models for how drugs distribute in, in the body and how long they'll stay in there. So they, so they can design clinical trials and, and get, you know, make the clinical trials as cheap as possible but still be able to get the results to show significance. So, <clears throat> but anyways, that's all nonlinear. We're doing linear. So y is distributed normally at each x value. The variance of y at every value of x is the same, so you have homogeneity of variances, and the observations are independent. <coughs> I hate this cough. So, and this is, this is what we just described, right? You have variances for y, and they're equal at every point. You get like a normal distribution around every point for y. And that's called a, a, a Gaussian distribution of y values, and that's your normal simple linear regression. There's also a Deming regression where you have the data distributed over x and y. So, <clears throat> and this shows you the, the, the same thing, but just a different looking picture, right? This is y, this is x, and then you have a normal distribution around each point. So, standard error of y given x is the average variability around the regression line at any given value of x, and it's assumed to be equal at all levels of x. And appropriate clinical laboratory use of regression analysis. So you will do this, in fact, this is like our next chapter. We got to compare results from a new procedure versus results from an established procedure. Why would you want to, if you have an established procedure, start a new procedure to measure the same analyte, huh? Cheaper. Cheaper. That's the main thing that drives progress in labs is cutting costs, right? Progress in labs and hospitals, everything they want to cut costs. So soon enough, there'll just be robots, and you guys will be obsolete. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Smith. <laughs> is that what he says? Yeah. <laughs> so, all of the correlations is about how they're going to make everything dead side, where it's just like automated. They just put it in, and it tells you everything there. And he like makes you read reports about it, and everything's changing. And we're just sitting there all the past. <laughs> okay. That sucks. But I've gone and seen the robot at North Florida. It's pretty impressive. Like the, the, the tubes come in via like those like bank teller tubes. The tubes of blood come in that way. The tech will unload them, read the barcodes, put them on the machine. The machine takes them, reads the barcode so it knows what tests have to be done. It puts it in a centrifuge if it has to be centrifuge. And then it takes it around this little conveyor to all the different machines and it runs the tests on it. <laughs> 
pretty crazy. <laughs> but you guys are safe because somebody still has to do quality control on that machine. <laughs> so one another is a comparison of a technique versus a reference method. Do you guys remember we talked about reference methods? What are reference methods? That's just like a, a more accurate method than your field method, right? So it's also probably be more expensive than a, a, a field method. So it's see how, how your method really shapes up versus a reference method. Comparison of paired results of the same test or analyte collected from two different analytical systems and currently in use. So that's gonna tell you the what? If you're looking at paired results of the same test or analyte, That'll give you an idea of the bias between the two groups, right? But you got to know the precision of each also to, deceit, to determine what the bias truly is or estimation. You never, you, you never find true values of anything. Everything's an estimation. So, Comparison of results from the same analytical system collected during two different anal analytical runs. <coughs> I don't know. My spelling is terrible on this. So this is the basic picture. I think this is in your book that shows you all the different components of regression analysis. So, and that's, that's all I was gonna do today. Do you guys have any questions over any of the math problems you've done to date? <laughs> then I don't have to go over anything today.